Steph's an, he's a number one receiver. Um, you know, it's, I firmly believe that, that. I'm not wavering off of that. I know there's various reasons or questions on this, there's production, all that, but um, I still see Steph as a number one receiver. Uh, yeah, I expect him to be here. I mean, we don't set up meetings or anything like that. We do our exit stuff at the end of the season, but uh, no, nothing, nothing's changed from that standpoint. AKA, we have no intent to trade Stephon Diggs. We spent a lot of time yesterday talking about his decision to respond to the Peaky Pirate on, on X on the question of whether or not Stephon Diggs' presence in Buffalo is essential to the success of Josh Allen. We're about to find out because late yesterday morning, right around 11 o'clock Eastern time, word landed that Diggs has been traded by the Buffalo Bills to not the Dallas Cowboys, not the Kansas City Chiefs, the Houston Texans. The Houston Texans. One team in Texas says they're all in. The other team doesn't say anything and goes all in with what they're doing this year to try to take advantage of the early years of C.J. Stroud's rookie contract. And with that, we say good morning. It's Thursday. For Chris, it's Friday. So it kind of feels a little like Friday for me, even, even though it's not Friday. I still have to work tomorrow. Chris is off tomorrow, but yep. at least we get a chance to sink our teeth deep into, deep into this. the unexpected, out of the blue, even though it isn't a complete surprise. No, especially it's not. When we look back at what Bean was saying. They were trying to conjure a trade market for the guy. He's a number one receiver, just not for us. But he's a number one receiver. Anybody want a number one receiver? Come on, come on. Here we go. Step right up. We got a number one receiver. Not for us. Maybe for you. And here we are. Well, yeah, you're right. I, I think we all felt like this could happen. Would they actually pull the trigger and do it, right? Would they actually, you know, take the cap hit that we'll discuss here in a minute and that goes involved in getting rid of Stefan Diggs? I think that's where people are like, hey, you know, I'm not sure they want to keep Diggs, but for where their team is right now and the money that he's, you know, been paid already and the cap number, I don't think they'll actually do it. I felt like that's how everybody felt. That's how I felt. Like, I don't, it's coming to an end. This is probably the last year for sure because now there's no cap consequences. That, that was my feeling with like a little bit of like, eh, I don't know. We'll see, right? And then, bam, I mean, just hits you out of nowhere yesterday. Shocking news really is. I mean, Stefan Diggs is a number one receiver for sure. That's not debatable, right? I, 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 that that I'm, I'm on board with Brandon Bean. Now, how good of a number one? Is he a superstar number one? Is he a guy that defensive coordinators get off the bus and are like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's Stefan Diggs today. I don't know. No, probably not that anymore. That's, that's definitely, I think, gone, but still really damn good. And what an, you know, what an accurate, uh, what do I want to say? Way to acquire a great player by the Houston Texans. Acquisition. 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 That was the word I was looking for. Acquisition. <laughs> Acquisition. <laughs> no. Acquisition. Yes. You didn't want to come out there. <laughs> yeah. What? We're both on record with our admiration, affinity, and just flat out love. Yeah. Stephon Diggs. Right. Great guy. Right. Interviewed him more times than I can remember. That said, how many number one receivers in the NFL haven't had a 100-yard receiving game since week six of the yeah. 2023 season yeah. through two playoff games, capping his career in Buffalo with three catches for 21 yards, capping his career in Buffalo with running underneath wide open or wide ass open, as Bruce Arians would say, when the quarterback instead tries to kind of thread a needle to Khalil Shakir in the end zone. Here it is. This is that... Wait, this is, this is the touchdown bomb against play. Kansas this City. Is, no, this is the one that he drops yes, against Kansas City. Right. This is the one that he could have caught. Yeah. The play at the end play. of the game. Remember the one we dissected where it feels like they're methodically going down the field and they yep. decided we're going to try to do this just right, work the clock, not give the ball back to Patrick Mahomes. They came out of the two-minute warning, screw it, we're throwing it for the end zone. Yeah. On that play where Josh Allen throws it to the end zone. Yep, and gets hit Diggs in the back. Diggs is running underneath. Right. With no, no one's covering him. Right. No one's covering him. He doesn't look his way. Right. And so... And I think it goes to the pivot from Ken Dorsey to Joe Brady. I feel like that, and you've said this before, that's where Diggs didn't really fit the way that he used to. And so if you're not going to use the guy like a number one, we'll find out if he still is a number one. But if you're not going to use him like he's a number one, time to move on, which I'm sure was a big factor in the Bills thinking. Look at what we're paying him. Look at how we're using him. Are we at the point where... 
We need to get value now because after another year of this, we're not going to be able to convince anyone he's a number one receiver. If we go another full year of him getting 50, 60 yeah, yards no, a game the, on that, average, yeah, sure, right. we're not going to get we're not going to get anything for him. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's you know a lot of valid points there to what you're saying. Right. I no. I, I mean, again, number one, yes, game changer. Where, like we just talked, like I just said, defensive coordinator off the bus, or wait, we can't win today if we don't double Stefan Diggs, or wait, I don't trust this corner or our best corner on him man to man. No, that that's not the case anymore. That's not. Teams might double him in a little certain situation here and there because they know, ooh, the Bills are going to go to him here on third and five, and they're going to stack him. And all right, so let's you know double him and in him at him because he might run some option route. But it's not like he's lined up outside like Jamar Chase or Ty. Tyree Kill, where you go, well, they're not going to leave any corner on their team one-on-one -on -one with him very much, so let's put the safety over there. Let's just take him out of the game plan. We can't mess with that right there. That, no way, right? And that's where, you know, again, I'll, I still say number one, really good. Superstar number one, no. Top five, no way. Top ten, no, I don't think so either, right? You know, but somewhere in that 10 to 20 range of really damn good. And if you got the right offense and the right system, he'll fit in that and really add value to that. And I think that's where it makes sense for the Houston Texans and Bobby Slowick and D'Amico Ryan and Nick Casario, you know, who was the ex-GM of the you know New England Patriots or so-called GM. I'm reluctant to compare anyone to Antonio Brown, but there's a thread there from the standpoint of the stuff that you have to be Deal willing with to a accept sure. if Stephon Diggs is on the team. Right. And there is some stuff. And it's not as overt. It's not as constant. But it's there. It goes back to last June when it all exploded. We talked about this yesterday. Sean McDermott comes out and tells reporters first day of the mandatory minicamp. Everybody's here except Stephon Diggs. Are you concerned he's not here? I'm very concerned. He left. And for 24 hours, we're trying to figure out well, where'd he go? Why'd he leave? What's going on? What are they going to do about this? The guy up and leaves the first day of mandatory minicamp. And then, oh, wait, the Bills told him to leave. And, you know, they didn't exactly handle him well. Maybe they didn't know quite how to handle him. That might be part of it. Maybe another team will know how to press his buttons the right way. Because a lot of the stuff, it's not really his fault. He's misunderstood. That's the best example of it. The Bills bungled that whole affair and created a dark cloud that never really completely dissipated over the situation, their relationship with Stephon Diggs. So yeah. I'm sure that has something to do with it. And maybe the Bills just got to the point where they recognized this situation is no longer tenable for us. Whoever's fault it is. And I think they bear blame as much or maybe more than Diggs. Because, look— Hey, I say this all the time, and this is a warning to Houston. Anytime you have a guy who sufficiently fell out of love with his current team to the point where he is actively trying to get out, you are the next one that he's going to reach that conclusion with. It's just a matter of time. He's already shown that, number one, he's capable of becoming sufficiently disgruntled to want out. And number two, he's willing to do something about it. And number three, it worked. So if he gets unhappy with you, he's already proven to himself. He knows how to get out. He's going to try to get out. It's going to be an issue that you're going to deal with. So this is a short-term thing. They got four years out of him. And, you know, I, I think that, that I'm not surprised at all. I fully expected this at some point. I thought it might happen last year. After the mandatory minicamp ugliness, it happens this year instead after they get another season out of him that still had 1,143 yards, I think, was his total number for the year in receiving. But from week six on, it wasn't the same guy. So I think they, they, they didn't sell high, but they sold as high as they could because the stock was going to drop, I think in 2024 for Stephon Diggs yeah, in well, Buffalo. There, there's, you know, it, it, listen, the history of it, there's there's obviously issues there, right? And we're going to unpack the trade and all of that, right? Everything I know, everything I know from some people in the league there, this is this was a mutual parting of ways, right? This was this was definitely like both sides were were done with each other, all right? So that that that's what I do kind of know. Now, to your point and what you're talking about here, right? I mean, Mike, 
It's way more than that. It's way – Buffalo was obviously so annoyed and couldn't deal with it anymore that they were willing to give a number one receiver for next year's 2025 second-round pick and take a $31 million cap charge. I think that, like, that needs to be in blinking lights. That tells you how sick yeah. they were of Stefan Diggs. That is monumental. Wait, he's still really good. We are not very good at receiver – but we can't stand him so much that we're going to just trade him for really not that great a value and take a $31 million cap hit. They are literally putting out a beacon that's going, we were so sick of him, we might have traded him for nothing. We couldn't take it anymore. We can't take it. Beep, beep, beep. I mean, that's what oh. that says to the NFL. I mean, that's the first thing I got from everybody yesterday. How much did the Bills not like Stefan Diggs to make that trade right there, right? And most of the public thinks the Texans fleece the Bills in the trade, and it looks like that, sure, but I think it's more about the te the Bills were washing their hands, they want no more part of it, and they are getting out of the Stefan Diggs business. Well, it's their own fault. It's their own fault, because they should have known what they were getting. They should have known they were getting a guy, if you don't handle him a certain way, he's not going to be happy, and he has a way of pressing your buttons to get you to the point where you're just fine. Let's move on. And at the end of the day, he got what he wanted. Right. He wins. I don't know how you could just say it's their fault, though. I don't know how you could just say that, right? Like I, that's what, because he, they knew or should have known what they were getting. Well, uh, they knew okay. or should have known they, that they were getting a guy that was right. potentially going to wear them out. I'm not going to blame they knew like or either known side it. here, right? I, 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 but like the Bills, for by all due accounts, did everything to make things like Josh Allen, the team itself, to make it work for Stefan Diggs. Nobody's had the ball thrown to them more in the last four seasons than Stefan Diggs. I mean, they made him the guy to like just feed him everything all the time. So no, I mean, I know, you know, you know what you're getting into there. And that's where hopefully Houston looks out here and gets a different Stefan Diggs who starts to realize, wait, I'm not a top five talent or top 10 talent anymore. I am getting up there in age a little bit. And if I keep having these ant antics, nobody's going to want me anymore. So I would hope that helps him and maybe his approach to things attitude-wise a little bit down there in Houston. Antics is the key word. I mean, okay, you're acknowledging that there are things about Stephon Diggs that need to change. So yeah. what a team can do is either come up with a plan for changing him and implement it effectively or get to the point where they just say, we can't take it anymore. And the Bills, knowing or at a minimum, should have known when they traded for Stephon Diggs four years ago, they were getting a guy that is wired a little differently than the rest and that you need to tread a little lightly with. And there are going to be moments where it gets difficult. What is our plan for when it gets difficult? What is our plan for trying to coax him to mature into something else than what he's been, where he will rush out of the locker room without talking to reporters? where he will gesture in the face of Josh Allen on the sideline during a 27 to 10 loss to the Cincinnati Bengals. So, Hey, look, See, those are the things the where Bills I'm going to blame Stefan Diggs a little bit there, right? Like you're, you're totally right. I'm not disagreeing with you in that you got to manage and massage this and make it work. But I think also, too, and just as a viewer, I don't know this. I'm not trying to say this is from them or anything, but just looking at it a lot of the times, you go, well, I mean, the year was great. All of a sudden, he's mad in a playoff game because he didn't get the ball enough and he wasn't happy with the result. And then the offseason became a disaster just off of a jump off point of that. Right. And again, I don't know the details of the fighting and what was going on with the conversations there and all that. And I'm not trying to act like I do, but certainly a lot of it seemed like, wait, I'm mad at this game. I didn't get the ball enough. And that filtered and funneled over to other areas of football life. And that's where it seems like the Bills got sick of all of it. Like this, this. Is the here you go. Like Josh Allen, like wants to look up and he wants to be like, to. who throws you the ball well, more than here, me? But who does? We've it? talked about this before. Yeah, hang on. Yeah. We've talked about this before. You know what Josh Allen needs to do in that moment? He needs to throw off his vest. He needs to stand up. He needs to grab Stephon Diggs, and they need to go have a conversation. And he needs to tell Stephon Mike, Diggs what's what. And I think of the story. Hang on, let me finish. I think of the story from 1994-ish when Warren Moon was a quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. 
And Chris Carter's doing that stuff. Because Chris Carter was well known for that stuff. Getting in the quarterback's face. I was open. Why didn't you throw it to me? And Warren Moon went to Chris Carter and made it very clear to him. You pull that shit again, and I'm never going to throw you the ball for as long as I'm the quarterback of this team. You got it? Do you got it? And I love Josh Allen. You love Josh Allen. You call him Boy Blue. Sometimes I think he kind of goes through life as an overgrown boy and doesn't really embrace what it means to be the quarterback of the team. And I think that's what a lot of this is, Chris. I think this is Josh Allen being positioned as he enters the back half of his prime. He's getting toward the back half of his prime. He's still in his prime. I think this is about the Bills recognizing we got to put guys around Josh Allen that he's comfortable leading because I think he's a big part of this. And maybe nobody could properly get through to Stephon Diggs. But I think that relationship was too much of Diggs doing whatever he wanted, saying whatever he wanted, and Josh Allen never calling him on it, not knowing how to do it, not wanting to do it because it's awkward. You know, a lot of people don't like confrontation. No, and this is a guy that likes it. And this is a guy that, again, if he did that on the sideline, my thing would be he would blow it up and make it worse and go crazier, and it'd be a bigger spectacle. And I think Josh Allen's smart enough to know, you know what? If I go do what Mike Florio just says right now, everyone's going to go crazy about this whole subject, and then everyone's going to be like, Josh Allen right can't there, handle though. his team and all this, and Josh Allen's losing his cool at the end of a playoff game. Hey, you can't lead your team. So, like, that's just talk, Mike. That's not really the reality well, okay, of that all the way. But Chris, right. Chris, Chris, you can get him in the locker room and do it there. You don't know you if he has him somewhere other. You don't know that. Eh. You know? I guarantee you he hasn't. I guarantee you that never happened. I guarantee you that never happened. Come on, Mike. Because there's never been any hint. We've seen Josh Allen talk about it. Josh Allen always has his back. There's never been a hint of any effort or any frustration or any attempt by Josh Allen to take over that relationship. That relationship was dominated by Stephon Diggs. As long as Diggs got what he wanted, everything was fine, and Josh Allen never pushed back I, at you're, this you're, disrespect yeah. that we saw from time to time. I'm, I'm making inferences based upon what we've seen. I know. And when and you I'm, see the I'm body language you, like, Josh nobody's Allen looking call down out a player like a school at a post-game press conference being, and do that. That's what uh, I oh, – if he okay. did that, you'd go, okay. he's a bad leader, Mike. You're putting him in like a well, no way. No, I if he did no, that, because we've never no, heard anybody say that no, type of stuff. Who's, who goes no, into a, a press a conference and, where you have and to do says stuff? Aaron Rodgers says it. When? Aaron Rodgers does it. When? As a team thing, he never calls it out. He called them out. He goes cryptically, like says coded stuff. That's not a cool way to do it's it either, still, and you agree with that. Well, right. Well, exactly. We also say, His ass also is out of Green a, Bay because everybody was sick of it. Mike, stop, stop. I just keep. Go ahead. You talk till the break. I won't say anything more. Go ahead. You okay, go. be a baby. Take That's it over. Right. Take right. it over. Good. I'm not well, being a baby. You are. For baby. Sake, let me talk. No, you talked a lot. Right. Get out of here. Shut up, you baby. Get out of here. Okay, here we go. See, this is what Josh Allen should do, uh, <laughs> but. I feel like at the heart of this, there was a failure to manage Stephon Diggs. Sure. That's the point. Whether it was Josh Allen not managing the way Tom Brady would have, Peyton Manning would have. I mean, that's the point. There's an, a relationship there that needs Tom Brady to couldn't handle managed. Antonio Brown. It wasn't. He couldn't handle it. Well, well, he wasn't there long enough for Tom what? Brady. What? They were living together. Antonio God damn, Brown. they were living together. Uh, Holy crap. I mean, come on. So it's just it not always easy was, fixable and, with these but guys. It was, but Antonio Brown, Antonio Brown ultimately imploded with someone else pushing his buttons, specifically Bruce Arians. That whole issue of was his ankle able for him to – that's a different issue altogether. My point is the Bills yes. and Diggs, right. I think there's equal blame there. I still say – Tread lightly when you trade for one of these guys that it wants out of wherever Agreed. he is. Right. Whoever the player is, tread lightly because you're next. Once you see people moving around here to here to here to here, at, at some point, you got to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that's where the Texans, you, you better have a plan. Maybe D'Amico Ryans can get through to Stephon Diggs. Maybe C.J. Stroud can get through to Stephon Diggs. Maybe C.J. Stroud will do what Warren Moon did to Chris Carter back in the early 90s when Chris Carter was acting the way we've seen Stephon Diggs act sometimes and get control of the relationship from the get-go. Maybe, as you said, Diggs will realize to the extent that he wasn't actively looking to get out and boom, he's gone, maybe that wakes him up. But oh, he's boy. getting to the point where he's yeah. 31. He's yeah. 31. Right. 
I, at some point, you got to realize if I want to get my fingerprints on a Super Bowl trophy, yeah, I, you know, and and he may be in a better chance to get one now. Yeah, maybe than he was in Buffalo. Yeah. Agreed there. You know, we talked about Kansas City yesterday. I right. think he's got a much better chance in Kansas City than Houston right now because of Patrick Mahomes. But the, the gap may not be that big. And look at what the Texans are putting together. And they're trying to do what they have to do to overcome the Chiefs and become a Super Bowl team. So, yeah. all right, we, we haven't talked about the terms. Well, 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 wait, terms. one more thing you, just off of that, because you, you said ahead. some good things there, and, and, and I agree with you. And I, I, I want to button You're it up. you along now. Well, I want to bet. I'm never yeah. mad over that. I'm mad for a second, and it was oh, just we're not about even, that. That's the thing. Hey. Yeah. We're, we're going to get we're going to get a bunch of emails right. saying, oh, no, mom and dad are fighting again. <laughs> and we never, like, we get over it like that. But, you know, that's the kind of relationship you need to have. When there's stress involved, when there's disagreements involved, you need to be able to talk it out and then move on. That's right. Like we have. All right, yeah. go ahead. Oh, so but the only thing I was going to say, like to your point, what you said earlier, right? You know, hey, you know, lower end number one. I don't know if he'll be that next year, right? The things I talked about, where yeah, it's not going to be like, oh, he's big play, catch slant, run seventy yards or a touchdown, bomb, all of that. You know, to your point there, I think that's what. You know, we're saying a little bit here, too, is the antics that you're talking about, we're talking about guy Antonio Brown and Chris Carter and guys that were playing at a superstar level, right? That, okay, like, I understand them being frustrated. I think Buffalo looked at it and went, went like, wait, you're really good, but you're not Tyreek or Justin Jefferson. You shouldn't be, like, causing this many antics. That, to me, would be another thing, you know, just being in the NFL, knowing that. That's where guys look at you and go, like, wait, you're good, but you're not, like, you know, God's gift to the world here. You shouldn't be going that crazy. And I think that's part of why Buffalo just said the hell with it all, too. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.